It gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Kellerman, who's a lecturer in sociology at the University of Manchester. Um, he has a wide range of interests in the historical changes that have characterised relations between the developed and the developing world. In particular, he's focused in his work uh, over several years on the British Labour Movement's approach to the colonies and colonial questions. He's looked at uh, the Labour Party's attitude to the Middle East, uh, Palestine in particular, also to Africa and to India. Uh, he's written a number of uh, well-received articles, and most recently, I better not. Look, I was going to lift this book up, but then the AV might go, so I'm <laughs> going to keep it on the table. Uh, um, uh, you can see them over there. So perhaps you know uh, someone else will hand it up there. There it is. Uh, um, the British Left and Zionism: History of a Divorce, uh, which was published by Manchester University Press last year. Um, Paul is going to uh, talk to that book. Um, I'm supposed to be offering some reflections uh, afterwards. I'm going to keep those very brief. You've come to hear Paul rather than to hear me, but hopefully we can then open up a discussion and talk uh, to uh, the various themes that Paul's going to raise. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Paul Kellerman. <laughs> I'm going to try and give you a, an overview of, of the book's argument, uh, but as I was preparing the talk, I, I realised that in order to condense it, I was going to have to do what people on this topic have been doing for years, which is to strip out the historical context. Um, and so I, I will try and to avoid that, although obviously in a short time, I will concentrate on some of the debates that have taken place and thereby the context is a bit to the background. Uh, I will just situate very briefly in relation to some of the, or at least two books, which um, take a slightly different point of view from what I have taken. Um, I just explained that the book consists of five chapters, and I'm only going to take kind of snapshots from three of the chapters. So I will not say anything about the um, chapter 2, Zionism and anglo Jewry, although clearly one of the specific features about the Zionist issue in Britain is the fact that there is a sizable community in this country who provided a financial and a political resource for the Zionist campaign. But um, the, Zionist, the Jewish community itself was not particularly Zionist pre-war, pre-Second World War. And one of the aspects I looked at was how it became um, Zionized. And certainly one aspect of that is the fact that the Jewish community became increasingly uh, middle class. So from a working class community with a strong Communist Party implantation, the commu community became increasingly nationalist and, and right-wing, but that has to be put in a political context because the political factor that favoured uh, Zionist propaganda in respect of that community was the fact that both in the late 30s and then after the war, um, the liberal democracies made it absolutely clear that they will not receive uh, Jewish immigrants except in small numbers. So then in that situation, the appeal of Zionism, that let's send the uh, Jews to being persecuted or being displaced after the war, let's send them to Palestine, became a more attractive proposition to them. So it, it, it's both sociological and political. I also will not say something about the shaft on new anti-Semitism. That's the political response that has accompanied um, the fact that there has emerged over the past two or two and a half decades, a much stronger pro-Palestine uh, campaign. But obviously in the discussion, uh, you may want to raise that. Now, as I say, I'll try and just say briefly about how my book contrasts with some other works on this subject. Now, the book that came out last year by Colin Schindler, I think epitomizes the approach that has generally been taken on this subject. And uh, Schindler discusses mainly the views of Marxists, but without relating their views to developments in Palestine and the Middle East. Now, it's true that Marxists themselves 
uh, certainly in the 1920s, uh, discussed Zionism primarily in relation to its impact on the Jewish working class in Europe, of which there were about 13 to 14 million. So whether it was Lenin or Kautsky, Stein or Trotsky, or the Jewish Bund, uh, notwithstanding their differences, they were all opposed to Zionism from the point of view that Jewish workers have to make common cause with a non-Jewish working class and that shipping them off to Palestine to become a separate nation was not the solution. But then from 1929 riots onwards in Palestine, um, communists began to assess Zionism increasingly by reference to the role of imperialism in the Middle East Arab nationalism and the political developments in Palestine. So the, the focus then shifts to what is the impact of Zionism, not in Europe so much, but in the Middle East. But Schindler examines a radical last position not by relation to the historical events that they address, but how far they measure up to the tenets of Zionism. As a consequence, he ignores the effect of Zionist state building on the Palestinians and the wider Arab world. It is as if the left formulated its position on the Palestine conflict purely by reference to Jews and anti-Semitism. For Schindler, the West European left's pro-Zionism needs no explanation, only its anti-Zionism, because that he considers an aberration, a symptom of dogmatism, or still worse, of anti-Semitism. But this gives quite a distorted picture, not only of the conflict in Palestine, but of the West European left, which has been overwhelmingly social democratic since the beginning of the 20th century and supportive of Zionism from the First World War until at least the early 1980s. Among Zionist historians, only Josef Gorny takes a slightly different approach, at least in the sense that he gives due weight to the British Labour Party and tries to account for its support for Zionism. Now, Gorney attributes the pro-Zionist position of the Labour Party uh, to the party's socialist humanist tradition and his belief in the advantage of establishing a social society in Britain. Now, of course, the, the subtext to saying that uh, is based on social humanist tradition, humanistic tradition is that... Um, anyone with their senses would support Zionism. Uh, Gorney's interpretation of um, Labour Zionism, paradoxically, is not actually that different from what the left has tended to tell itself of its record vis-à-vis -vis, uh, Palestine. Um, I mean, the, the narrative that the left adopts is that... Um, the Holocaust and elicited enormous sympathy for the Jewish people and hence socialist rallied to the establishment of a Jewish state and to, and, and, and therefore to Israel establishment and that was subsequently reinforced by the fact that Israel had a parliamentary de democracy, a welfare system and a series of um, labor governments um, which, which uh, claimed to be socialist. Hence, continues this account, it was only after 1967 that socialists gradually became conscious of Zionism's disastrous impact on Palestinians. Now this version is not entirely mythical, but it is wrong in very important respects. Uh, for one, the British Labour Party and most European social democ democratic parties uh, declared their support well before the rise of Nazism. Indeed, it did so even before the Balfour Declaration. Two and a half months before the Balfour Declaration, the British Labour Party adopted a resolution almost identical in terms to the Balfour Declaration, and that resolution was subsequently adopted by other socialist parties throughout Europe. Now, the other aspect which is questionable 
is the argument that a humanitarian response to anti-Semitism and indeed to the Holocaust naturally led to support for the establishment of a Jewish state. Well, in fact, the most obvious humanitarian response to the Holocaust and to the displaced people who then um, occurred, liberated from the concentration camps, what would have been to welcome them into the liberal democracies, and in the case of the British Labour Party, to welcome them into Britain. Um, that would have been possible both in the 1930s and after the war, when um, Britain actually admitted about 190,000 Poles and Ukrainians, but would not consider mass Jewish immigration. Uh, therefore, the, the idea, the argument that Zionist option necessarily followed from a humanist or socialist outlook quite simply does not stand up. Now, I'm going to discuss um, the left outlook on the Palestine Zionist conflict in, in, under four um, subheadings, four kind of snapshots uh, to indicate some of the arguments and the concepts which the left uh, deployed. Um, now, um, the Labour Party's uh, position, um, I indicated to you um, in the 1917 War Aims Memorandum, but the important um, phase really begins in the, in the 20s when Zionism is popularised in Britain, particularly from the late 20s onwards, mainly by the Labour Party. The Labour Zionist movement which is the left wing of the Zionist movement, establishes close relationship with the Labour Party leadership and um, finds a vehicle in uh, the party's press. It presents an image of the Yishuv as a of the Jewish community in Palestine as building a social society. The emphasis is on the kibbutz and the trade, and the trade union and the historiate. The images that they invoke and the arguments they transmit um, that the Labour Party transmits, comes from the Labour Zionist movement. And I should just briefly indicate to you how the Zionist movement divides up in very crude terms. There were the general, general Zionists, or sometimes called bourgeois Zionists. This was headed by Heim Weizmann, who becomes the president of Israel um, after 48, or like four, in four, uh, after the establishment of Israel in May 48. Um, now, the, the, the general Zionists, or bourgeois Zionists, envisaged... Uh, a Jewish state being basically on the model of a Western capitalist society, a liberal democracy with a Western-style capitalist economy. The Labour Zionists, Paul Atzion, uh, the principal organisation with a number of branches in different parts of Europe as well as in, in Palestine, um, argued that they wanted to establish a social society and wanted to develop working-class institutions uh, to do that. I will not say anything about the revisionist Zionists, because actually in Britain, they, although it was a, a right-wing, uh, <coughs> the right-wing the right of the Zionist movement, and, and today the, uh, the, the uh, current government is directly the heirs of them, but it, they did not have much of an impact on Britain. Um, it's really the first two that had an impact, and they had a division of labour uh, between them. Uh, in terms of lobbying work. Uh, Weizmann, who, who grouped around himself some wealthy Jewish businessmen in Manchester and some uh, liberal professionals, uh, journalists uh, and uh, so forth, um, lobbied mainly the liberal and conservative politicians on the basis that the Jewish Palestine would be useful for the British Empire. Um, at the same time, Weizmann funded, helped to fund the Polizion's activity, the Labour Zionist activity, to lobby the British Labour movement on the basis that organising workers in a trade union and in the agriculture cooperatives, the kibbutzim, they were forming a social society. Um, it would also, they argued, regenerate the land, and this was a constant theme in Labour Zionist propaganda, uh, that it would also benefit the Arab population by teaching them modern techniques and providing markets for their goods. Now, an early indication of the ideological affinity 
between the um, British Labour Party and Zionism is evident in the run-up to the formulation of the War Aims Memorandum. Uh, the Labour Party's colonial policy in this period is, was heavily influenced by J.A. Hobson. Hobson is, was a liberal economist. Uh, he wrote a book about imperialism in 1902, and it has genuinely had a very good press, particularly on the left, not just then, but ever since, mainly because um, Lenin, in his work on imperialism uh, in 1916, was very complimentary about Hobson. Now, of course, Lenin did not agree with Hobson's overall analysis of imperialism. Hobson had argued that most of Britain's trade was with other industrialised countries, and therefore uh, the scramble for Africa, the land grab, uh, was unnecessary. Um, that's w that wasn't where Britain's uh, most important trade was. And he, he argued that imperialism only occurred in the interest of a small faction of the capitalist class who made profits out of the uh, military conquest and then invested in mines and railways in the new colonies. Um, in other words, for Hobson, the conquest of territory was not necessary, and he wanted capitalism to revert to the Pacific ways of free uh, trade. Now, of course, Lenin, by contrast, had a quite different interpretation. He said that the European power's imperial expansion reflected the stage when monopoly capitalism had developed, when markets had been saturated in terms of goods and investment, and therefore there was a push outward to new territories. Um, that capital needed these external outlets. But what Lenin approved in Hobson was the argument that imperialism reflected uh, the decay and increasingly parasitic oops, um, character of capitalism. And Hobson had pointed to um, a growing group of what he called coupon clippers who lived off the investments in the colonies without any active involvement in, in any of the expansion of the capital. And this, this formed part of Lenin's argument against Kautsky that imperialism could not overcome capitalism's contradiction. In other words, that the system was in a stage of decay. This was a final stage. But while Lenin was attracted to this aspect of Hobson, the Labour Party's colonial experts took a completely different argument from his work. Because although Hobson was critical of imperialism, he actually left the door open to what he called sane imperialism. And sane imperialism uh, was, in his view, um, legitimate um, on the part of civilised white nations to take control of lower races. Um, here it is. It cannot be seriously maintained, he said, that any group of inhabitants, by virtue of mere priority of occupation, or because they have for a certain time exercised government over a territory, would have a right, save in a strictly legal international sense, to neglect or abuse resources, the utilisation of which might be an urgent need for the world at large. Um, now, the socialism propagated by Labour Zionism shared this conception of colonisation. Um, and Shlomo Kaplansky, who was the Polatzion representative in Europe, circulated a document <coughs> to all the socialist parties in Europe, which was then also published in um, a Labour Party magazine, edited at the time by Ramsay MacDonald. Um, and it was also taken up by people within the Labour Party's uh, advisory committee on imperial questions. That was an advisory committee for the executive, which considered colonial question, one of whom was Charles Buxton, who was very much an uh, acolyte of, um, Hobbs, of um, Hobson. And he says, again, the same sentiment, I cannot admit the contention that the people who for a time being occupy a certain portion of the Earth's surface are necessarily entitled to exclude from it others who could use it better for the good of the whole. Um, so the, there they... they um, is a position which is very similar to Kaplansky's argument, circulating, as I say, to various socialist parties, arguing that the Arabs have no right to prohibit the approach of other land and, and work-seeking people to soil which is lying idle. And he, um, he distinguished the socialist colonisation policy of the Labour Zionist movement uh, 
based on Jewish labour from the colonial policy of imperialism which seeks the exploitation of peoples and countries. Um, in other words, a supposedly more advanced people have the right to settle in a country deemed to have been neglected or left undeveloped de by uh, the existing inhabitants. Hence the constant propaganda uh, by the Zionist movement that Palestine has been neglected. Now there were other elements of ideological affinity between the, the two movements, between the labour movement and the Z labour Zionist movement. Um, for, um, for, for, for the labour movement, uh, the socialism of the kibbutzim appealed as a moral purification, a return to land. Actually, there were a variety of tendencies in, in Britain from the 1890s onwards, which, which had the argument that there was something decadent about Britain. There was something, uh, urban concentration has brought about decay. Now, of course, different ideological currents interpreted that decay differently. Uh, some interpreted as due, the decay was due to the aristocracy. That was on the liberal wing. But some people interpreted it that the decay came because the working class um, had degenerated, b being in these unsavory conditions, unsalubrious conditions in the city centers. And actually, um, Herbert Morrison, who is one of the most strongly pro Zionist figures in the Labour Party, he becomes deputy leader of the Labour Party in 1935, um, talks about how in East London, the Jewish population is, he says, um, nervous. He says they, they, they are quarrelsome. And he compares them to the Jews on the land in Palestine who are, he says, uh, strong and, and vigorous and healthy. Well, uh, that, of course, is a, a characteristic anti-Semitic theme. And I just comment that, that Zionist writers never, ever highlight the anti-Semitism of um, pro-Zionist writers. I mean, they go on about Ernest Bevin, who, who in my view was not anti-Semitic, but, they, but, but, but of course, um, people like Herbert Morrison, or indeed Lord Balfour, after whom a street is named in West Jerusalem, uh, and who was, of course, the architect of the 1905 Aliens Act to keep Jews out, uh, is never mentioned their anti-Semitism. So there is this idea that returning, people returning to the land is, a, is an act of moral purification. There is a subordination of the class struggle to the national interest, which is very much the view also of the Labour Party. The Labour Party believes that there is um, uh, a reconcilable, the contradiction between labour and capital is reconcilable, and that there is an overarching <laughs> national interest in which both labour and capital can participate. And of course this is precisely the labour Zionist argument that the, um, which I'll come to um, in a minute, but it's, um, uh, it's the idea that the uh, Jewish working class in order to build uh, socialism in Palestine has to collaborate with the Jewish bourgeoisie from whom the capital must necessarily come. They first must create a nation, and then uh, the working class can create socialism. But the, the national objective was always a priority for the Labour Zionist movement. It always um, trumped any class um, organisational demand. It was also an antithesis, a Labour Zionist model, with this, uh, was always an antithesis of the Bolshevik model, firstly by this downplaying of the role of the class struggle, but also in the way that he argued that the working class must build institutions such as the agricultural cooperatives and trade unions, and then gradually these institutions would uh, expand and, and uh, take over society. But there's no question here of uh, an uprising against a state and its destruction and the creation of a cognitive state. Um, and of course, uh, there's the appeal which in becomes important for the Labour Party that all of the um, all of what the Labour Zionists offer can be accomplished within the British Empire uh, in 1918 initially uh, 1917 18 the Labour Party joins a euphoria towards self-determination which the Bolsheviks self-determination towards colonial nations which 
the Bolshevik party had uh, propagated as a matter of principle and to, to weaken the imperial powers, of course. Uh, and, and Woodrow Wilson played catch up by also rallying to that cry. And at that time, the Labour Party too embraced that view, but rapidly in the 1920s, it abandons that position and says basically nobody's ready for self determination among the colonies, so we will look after them and <laughs> guide them. <laughs> And, and, and finally, there's also the appeal that um, the Jewish settlement in Palestine can modernize the Arab world. That's a constant theme um, in Labour Zionist propaganda. So, I now go to the Communist Party. Now, the uh, Communist Party, in terms of membership, was relatively small, certainly... Um, between in the, in the 20s it was a very small party but then from 35 onwards the very sectarian line that we have taken about uh, all um, social democrats are social fascists and there can, can be no cooperation with anybody who's not a full-blooded communist once it abandons that position and attempts to reach out to, to uh, on a more broad front basis inspired by what's happening in, in, in France the popular front it then begins to pick up in membership and also in influence. And um, by, by, by 36, it has 7,500 members, but then it rapidly accelerates. Uh, and its influence is quite significant on the left wing of the labor movement and also among intellectuals. Uh, now, the interesting thing about the Communist Party is that it... Um, Oops, sorry. Uh, it, um, it is critical of um, Zionism, um, Communist Party publications throughout the 30s point out that the Zionist movement is dependent on British imperial protection. It would not be possible without it. It characterizes it as a tool of imperialism to maintain control of Palestine and emphasizes that it, it's a, it has a... Uh, it, operates as a divide and rule, dividing the Jews from the Arabs. Uh, now, while the Labour Party had made no mention of the Histadruits sectarian practices, this is a general federation of Jewish trade union, um, the fact that it excluded Arab workers, where it made no mention of the fact that the kibbutz excluded Arab workers, and even though they were supposed to be socialist cooperatives, they were organized clearly on ethnic basis to take control of um, the land and therefore excluding Arab workers. So the Communist Party constantly criticized this. And uh, during the 1936 Arab uprising, the first six months consists of a general strike by Arab workers. The Labour Party condemns this strike, saying that it's not like our strike in 1926. <laughs> uh, it's not really peaceful. Um, and um, says that it was engineered by Mussolini and feudal leaders. <laughs> Whereas the Daily Worker covers it supportively and it highlights uh, British military oppression. It points out house demolition, collective punishment, etc. But it's also important, I think, to note the limits of the Communist Party's critique. I mean, it shows no awareness of the specificity of settler colonialism. It, it, it depicts the, um, uh, the Zionist movement in very crude instrumentalist terms, as simply a tool for imperialism, but not as a, as a political force that has its own institutional structure and its own internal dynamics. And the, as a result, the Communist Party constantly anticipates unity between Arab and Jewish workers while ignoring the factors that inhibit that. Um, it even ignores the fact that Jewish workers collaborate with the British to try and break the 1936 Arab um, general strike. Now, why did the, the communists fail to grasp the, the specificity of settler colonialism. I mean, for example, why didn't they apply the concept of labor aristocracy, which, which Lenin had brought forward to explain why 
the workers in the different uh, Western countries, instead of fighting their own bourgeoisies, had enthusiastically supported the war on both sides, on both the German side and on the French and, and um, um, British side. Well, um, Lenin had argued about you know, bribing but with super profits. And the problem with that concept has always been to try and find a, a sociological stratum which corresponds to what um, Lenin had described. And people have variously said, well, maybe it's the skilled workers who were better paid, or maybe it's the trade union bureaucrats, or perhaps it's specific workers, such as in the military or in uh, the cotton industry, who were directly dependent on um, the British Empire. But, look, but it, it, there's, there's always been a problem to, to, to know how to fit it. But in, actually, in, in the case of the uh, Jewish workers in Palestine, it fits pretty well. I mean, the, the World Zionist Organization subsidized the Jewish workers, both in the public sector, because the, the British were reluctant to employ Jewish workers because they were more expensive than the Arabs, and they also subsidized uh, Jewish workers in terms of housing provision, all in order to, to capture the market from Palestinian workers. So, um, clearly, it was a privileged stratum which had a material interest in, in, in Zionism. And I think the reluctance is partly a kind of vestige of economism, you know, a kind of class reductionism. Everybody's a worker, irrespective of the political institutions into which they have been integrated. You know, the idea that workers have no nation. And in, there's even was a kind of residue of the argument that, of course, the, the left has always opposed um, discrimination against migrant workers. To oppose immigration was, was seen as reactionary. And here they, they completely misunderstood the, the nature of Zionism, that uh, this was not about settling workers alongside another group of workers or amidst them. This was a question of displacing those workers, of building an alternative economy which would exclude the indigenous population. But despite all these weaknesses, uh, the Communist Party's criticism of Zionism, with all its limitations, represented a significant anti-Zionist influence, both on the labour movement and on intellectuals, and of course particularly on its own membership, including its Jewish membership, which in the 1930s was significant. But all that changed in 1947 when the Soviet Union changed its position because of the conflict between the Zionists and the British over allowing further immigration. The, the, the Soviet Union then opportunistically swung its support behind the establishment of a Jewish state, believing that that would weaken British imperialism in the Middle East, and the, the Communist Party tamely fell in line with that position, and the reactionary uh, Labour Zionists overnight became progressive. The Daily Worker's foreign editor went round speaking at rallies in Britain along with Zionists. Okay, now let me go on to um, the post-war um, situation and, and to um, Richard Crossman, who I think in many ways exemplifies um, the Labour Party's position. Now, an indication of where the Labour Party was going is um, implied in a 1944 um, yep, conference resolution, <laughs> thank you, um, which um, basically amounts to uh, embracing ethnic cleansing. It means the removal of the Palestinians to make way for um, the uh, Jewish population. Now, the, uh, in 1946, um, um, Crossman was appointed to be a member of the Anglo-American Commission, which looks into uh, the Palestine issue, but it looks at it in conjunction with 100,000 Jewish displaced people, 100 to 140,000 Jewish displaced people, people who have been liberated from the concentration camp, and whose numbers 
would be swelled by um, <coughs> Jews coming, leaving some of Eastern Europe because of a resurgence of anti-Semitism, in, particularly in Poland um, in, in 46 and 47. Uh, now, Crossman, in, in many ways, uh, provides an interesting example because um, uh, he was on the, on, on the left wing of the Labour Party. Um, but, but notice that um, how the Commission's remit is framed. Already, the Palestine issue is, is, is linked to the resolution of what to do with the displaced people. And of course, when the Commission undertakes this task, including Crossman, they know full well that it is quite simply not on the agenda to say that these uh, liberated Jews should be allowed to come to Britain and to the other liberal democracies. Now, Crossman kept a diary of his experience as a member of that inquiry and subsequently published his reflection in a book called Palestine Mission. Now, um, um, sorry, I meant to... Uh, William Roger Lewis, who is the general editor of the uh, Oxford Encyclopedia on the British Empire, uh, says that for perception of the Arab as well as the Jewish side of the case, Palestine mission stands above all other contemporary writings of the committee. Crossman's insights were penetrating and imaginative. Well, I've not found anything penetrating and imaginative in Richard Crossman, and, and actually um, Roger Lewis doesn't say what these imaginative and penetrating ob observations are, and I can only deduce that, uh, that uh, Lewis hasn't read any Labour Zionist propaganda, because had he, he would have found that Crossman very largely repeats Labour Zionist propaganda. Uh, now, for the most part, uh, Crossman um, makes, as I say, repeats the Labour Zionist propaganda, but he also passes commentary on the Palestinians that is peppered with uh, racist remarks. Nonetheless, he does take a close interest in the Arab-Israeli conflict, both on this occasion and afterwards. He died in 1974, and he was notorious for flip-flopping on every single issue that he embraced. Uh, but um, when he was asked whether he was consistent on any point, he said it was Zionism. That was the <laughs> one point that he was uh, consistent. So, without he providing us with much insight, his reflections do provide us with some, um, in, a, in the way that social democratic Democrats thought about the Israel-Palestine issue. Now, as I said, Crossman visited the displaced camps in Austria, had hearings in London, Cairo, and Jerusalem, uh, and um, Crossman argued that the Jewish DPs in the camps did not want to go to Palestine simply because of Zionist propaganda. I mean, uh, all the Zionist organizations sent missionaries sent um, activists to the camps to, to um, persuade um, the, the, the liberated camp inmates to go to Palestine, mainly the, the, the men, so they'd be able to fight in Palestine. But although Crossman dismissed that, and actually there's quite good evidence that most Jewish people would have preferred to go somewhere else, um, he, he did admit that for nine months, huddled together, these Jews had nothing to do but to discuss the future. They knew, he says, that they were not wanted by the Western democracies. Now, he did not believe that a Jewish state could solve the problem of anti-Semitism. And he says that he would not support such a state himself if it were merely a national home. Only, he says, if it was a socialist commonwealth, intensely democratic, intensely collectivist and strong enough to fend for itself. He also claimed that in the long run, a Jewish state would be beneficial to the Arabs. In other words, his conditions for supporting a Jewish state were all the things that the Labour Zionists claimed would follow from the establishment of a Jewish state. 
1948-49, as the Nakba unfolded, and it became self-evident that the Palestinians would not benefit from Israel's formation, Crossman belittled the disaster inflicted on them. Defending the Israeli rejection of the proposal that the Palestinians be allowed to return home, um, he told Parliament in January 1949, they, the Israelis, say how stupid it would be to move them back. Above all, these villages are only mud huts anyway. They were terribly bad villages full of vermin. Remember, we're talking here about Jaffa and Haifa, as well as, of course, villages which have been farmed for centuries. Uh, but more importantly than that, it actually obscures the enormous wealth that was transferred by the Palestinians, from the Palestinians that were displaced, to the Israeli, newly established Israeli state. It was a massive financial transfer, much, much more important than any foreign assistance, which is, has also been substantial, that it received in the first few years. Now, Crossman, in subsequent years, linked the support for Israel to the idea of building a non-aligned force in, the inter in, the, in, the, in international politics. A third force. Now, you know, you heard that from Mussolini and you heard that from Tony Blair. And it was an idea that there could be a social democratic bloc, which would include Britain, because, of course, at that time Britain was under a Labour government, and it would be independent both of the US and of the Soviet bloc. Of course, by the early 1950s, it was evident that Israel, far from being, uh, was far from being independent, and the idea that it would be non-aligned was also a pipe dream. By in 1970, in the face of Israel consolidating its occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, Crossman appeared to have some doubts about the Israel that he had so vociferously supported. In 1960, he had argued... Rather than increase its Arab population, any Israeli government will deny itself extension of territory. Ironically, the exclusiveness of Israeli nationalism, an exclusiveness, incidentally, that the Labour Party never had previously spoken about, is the best guarantee that the Arabs possess against the threat that Israel will ever launch an expansionist war. Now when, of course, in post-67, this turned out to be completely absurd, uh, the annexation of East Jerusalem, the settlement growth. Um, in 1970, Crossman, who is the editor at that stage of the New Statesman, Statesman um, writes a letter to uh, the Israeli Foreign Minister, Abba Eban, uh, who's, who's supposed to be a dove, and he says that, uh, that um, uh, Israel is becoming like a Prussian military state. Um, now, Abin's reply, this is what he, he says, uh, Abin's reply does not address actually the issue of settlement. It comes up with a number of cliches about how Israel is still the land of the kibbutz, etc., which incidentally, never more than 5% of the Israeli population were uh, engaged. Um, well, was Kosman reassured by Abay Ban's reply? Um, he probably was, despite the, the, despite the fact that the settlement expansion was continued. Um, and his hope that Israel would lead the Arab world as a non-aligned force, leading, leading neither to the US nor the Soviet Union, had also not been realised. Uh, in fact, the conflict that Israel's establishment generated led to more foreign involvement in the Middle East, not less. Okay, finally I'll come to um, the um, period when the new left emerges uh, in 67, uh, 68 and um, the debate between Marcel Liebman and Ralph Miliband it consists of a, an exchange of letters between the two of them. Uh, they were of similar age and background, both were Jewish. Miliband had fled with his father to the United Kingdom during the war, and he became a Marxist here and an academic. Liebman also grew up in Belgium. His brother was uh, sent to Nazi concentration camp and died there. Um, 
after the war, Liebman too became an academic and a Marxist, uh, but he was much more of an activist than um, Ralph Miliband. He took part in the campaign in Belgium on the, on the side of the uh, Algerian independence movement, the FLN. Uh, they, they were good friends and they, they exchanged um, letters fairly regularly. But the, the 1967 war led to some very tense exchanges between them and, and threatened to, to tear their friendship apart. Uh, the debate subsequently continued in the Socialist Register, where um, Miliband's position is, is argued by a proxy, by a, another academic called Mervyn Jones, who, who, who basically puts Miliband's argument. Um, now, I just want to concentrate a few aspects of this debate as it takes place both in the letters and in the subsequent exchange of articles in, in the Socialist Register. Now, um, Miliband's argument was that Nasser's closure of the Tehran Straits, which, which uh, directly precipitated the 67 war, but which actually was a um, more a, a symbolic gesture um, rather than a, a genuine threat of war, and of course the Israelis knew full well. Uh, but nonetheless, um, Miliband says that it was aimed at weakening Israel and could only be justified if one accepts a goal of wiping out the state of Israel. And therefore Miliband was critical of those on the left who took Nasser's standpoint. Um, he said it was not acceptable goal either from an anti-imperialist or from a humanitarian point of view to seek the, the destruction of Israel. Um, Israel, um, he argued, was a minor factor in the U.S.'s confrontation with the Arab world. And he said Israel is a refuge of two and a half million Jews who carry with them um, the suffering of centuries, the disappearance of the state, would have an exceptional... Am I on the wrong? Would have... Um, would have um, the disappearance of the state would have an exceptional human dimension. In other words, it's either Israel or genocide. But Lehman, in his reply, uh, distinguishes between the Israeli nation and the Israeli state. Jews, as a nationality, could he pointed out, exist within a Palestinian state. And he argued that the PLO was, in fact, making steps in this direction. He pointed to the PLO's rejection of the line that the Jews should be thrown out, uh, which was associated with, probably unjustifiably, but nonetheless associated with Ahmed Shukeri, who, who was then displaced by um, uh, Yasser Arafat. Now, Liebman concedes that the PLO still only envisages giving Israeli Jews individual rights within a Palestinian state, rather than recognise their collective national existence. But by the time he writes his article in the Socialist Register, uh, he is able to point to the fact that the Popular Democratic Fund for the Liberation of Palestine had announced that he recognised the national rights of Israeli Jews. And this, Liebman says, should go a long way to allay the fears of Israeli Jews that this is not an issue of um, being liquidated. Um, I mean, physically liquidated. The other issue that arises in the debate is whether Israel's formation, the colonisation of territory which is already inhabited and many of which consequently led to the forcible removal of most of their inhabitants, has any bearing on the dynamics of the subsequent conflict. Now, uh, Jones's position is that in the course of history, quite a number of nations, including Arab nations, have carried through a process of settlement or invasion. And it therefore, he says, it was possible to see Israel's formation as the product of errors and even crimes, such as, of course, the place of the United States, and still uphold Israel's right to exist. He says there are two nationalisms now in collision, each denying the other right to statehood. Now, Liebman takes issue with this paradigm that you have two fundamentally nationalist movements equivalent forces, political equivalents, 
two nationalism scrapping for the same territory. And the distinction for him is not fundamentally a moral one. In other words, what is significant for him is not that Israel was born with the original sin of expelling the indigenous inhabitants, which has tainted the state forevermore. That, that is not his point of view. The central issue is that the Zionist project, by establishing a state for Europeans, entered into collision with Arab nationalism and, of course, also with Palestinian nationalism. Israel could therefore never cut its dependence on Western imperialism. From this derives what Liebman calls the permanence of a kind of logic, the continuity of a situation. It was not only the social democrat Crossman that failed to see the contradiction that was driving Zionism to try to defeat Palestinian Arab nationalism. In 1967, Miliband had written to Liebman there are no doubt Israelis, even in high places, who would like to annex a good chunk of Jordan. Remember, this is Jordan, we're talking about the West Bank here, which is reprehensible. But are there serious Israeli plans to conquer and subjugate Arab people outside of his territory? Nonsense. <laughs> so finally, what is the most important lesson that comes out of these debates of the left? I think uh, we can be more concrete and clearer than Liebman managed to be when he spoke of the permanence of a kind of logic, the continuity of a situation. The so-called Jewishness of Israel is utterly peripheral to the fundamental contradiction that engulfs it. Israel is an extension of Western imperial power into the Arab world. That is the basis for its survival. And that is why Israel is so desperate to affirm that it is European and part of the West. Whereas Israel was once able to mobilise support because it claimed to represent socialism, Western support is now bestowed on it because it represents kith and kin, fighting on the empire's frontiers in the defence of the imperial order, just as Theodore Herzl had imagined. But there is an important difference. Whereas until the late 1970s, and perhaps even a bit beyond, Israel enjoyed substantial popular support in Britain. Support for it now has shrunk mainly to the Jewish community, which however, where however dissension is growing, to the far right and to the political elite. And this is not just me speaking. Here is Ron Prosser, the Israeli ambassador who was in to the UK but he's now the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations and this was his, his uh, salvo, final salvo in a, in a farewell interview to the Jewish Chronicle where he says precisely this that now it's only the elite down below um, there is serious damage and leaking in the basement <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> So this is a great work of scholarship on this particular question, but it also, I think, um, raises a lot of questions and interesting issues about the left more generally, some of which we might want to unpick in, in, in debate. And I want to keep my remarks very brief because I'm sure that there are interesting questions and we want to hear uh, Paul talk further. But to me, um, what's very interesting about the, the, the analysis that Paul gave us was changing ideas that the left has about class, nation, state, the individual, um, about uh, Labour's thinking before um, and to some extent after the Second World War about uh, empire, colonies, the relation of class to uh, imperial and colonial questions, the relation of class to state and nation, I think, are important themes that come out in these debates.
And also, especially in the, the later years from the 60s onwards, the uh, language of rights, of individual rights, um, the tension between the language of individual rights, uh, which come to dominate the discourses from 70s onwards, the language of human rights, humanitarian intervention, the role of NGOs, uh, and how that relates to issues of class, mass mobilisation, some of the, the different sorts of languages and dreams and aspirations of earlier in the century. And maybe we could talk about uh, some of those tensions uh, in the discussion. Um, issues of modernisation, Paul mentioned uh, some of the, the Labour thought about modernisation, a, a word that um, has interesting resonances uh, in many different ways throughout the period. And again, something that's interesting in, in the language of the left uh, and the way it picks up on some themes that uh, come from far beyond the left as well. Um, a couple of other things that we might want to, to pick out. Um, in the book, Paul talks about the Cold War context um, and uh, the, the importance of that Cold War context and the role of, of um, Israel as a sort of strategic partner that came through towards the end and, and the way in which that Cold War context shaped some of uh, the dynamics of the debates that, go, that went on. Um, I would also like to hear more um, and to discuss the role of the media. I mean, that's been an important question in, in these debates. Um, uh, certain of those uh, figures uh, had, you know, Crossman as, as editor of, of New Statesman, but media more, more broadly, that's become quite a, um, a major part of the debate in, in the last few decades about the role of the media in reporting this question and, and the responsibilities of the media. Uh, and the left's had quite a lot to, to say uh, on that. And, and, and finally, the role of the US um, in all of this and the left's relationship to the US, not just on um, issues of Zionism, but more broadly. All of these, I think, play a factor in some of the changing dynamics that we see and that Paul has teased out. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave my comments there because I, I really want to, to open the floor to questions. Um, and uh, please feel free to pick up on any of the range of issues that, that Paul has, has uh introduced uh, this evening and I'm sure Paul will, will uh, come back and answer um, uh, with his, uh, you know, his, his detailed knowledge of the subject. So I open the floor to questions.